Everybody thinks that there's no privacy and that everything's public, but that's not actually true. It's only true if you go on the internet. <laughs> so if you can keep off your phone for one second, then you can have some moments of privacy. I'm trying. I'm trying. You're trying. <laughs> I'm John Favreau. Welcome to Offline. My guest today is legendary Canadian author and poet Margaret Atwood. Margaret has been called the prophet of dystopia, which, unfortunately for us, has become increasingly accurate. Over the course of 18 novels, 9 story collections, and 18 books of poetry, Atwood has shown an eerie ability to predict the creeping spread of theocracy and totalitarianism, most notably with her 1985 novel, The Handmaid's Tale, which rocketed back into the public consciousness after the election of Donald Trump and a TV adaption. A couple weeks ago, she wrote a piece for The Atlantic titled Go Ahead and Ban My Book, where she takes on the Madison County, Virginia School Board, which recently banned The Handmaid's Tale from its schools. In the piece, Atwood argues that in a digital age, no book ban will actually keep her writing out of the hands of curious teenage students. It felt like a perfect offline conversation, so I invited Margaret on to talk about it. Here's Margaret Atwood. Margaret Atwood, welcome to Offline. Pleasure to be here. Um, I want to start with a big question about the state of the world. Uh, so there's obviously quite a bit to worry about these days, particularly if you're a, a fan of democracy. But I've also seen an argument uh, recently that 2022 was the year democracy fought back. Ukraine's still standing, Europe's stronger, Le Pen lost, Bolsonaro lost, Trump's candidates lost in our midterms. And I wonder, as someone who's uh, thought and wrote a lot about the struggle between democracy and autocracy, how do you think we're doing right now? I would say uh, I'm not counting you out. I'm not counting out the United States by any means, uh, but there are uh, certainly in the, the states that are banning books. And what is this nutty new law that you have to register if you have a blog and you're mentioned uh, anybody in government in Florida? What kind of a Soviet Union thing is that? Yeah, some kooky Republican legislator <laughs> introduced that bill. <laughs> Yeah, it's not a. It it wouldn't be a good thing. In fact, it would nope. be practically a 1930s Soviet Union kind of thing. So, if that's really where they want to go, maybe they should read a bit of history. Uh, yes, it's it's very strange, but I would say people are now that they've popped out of their slumber and uh, realize they can't take any of this for granted, I would say that they are that they are fighting back. What do you think are some of the conditions that gave rise to this latest wave of authoritarianism, sort of n not just in the United States, but all over the world? When conditions are unstable, and conditions are unstable, and they're partly unstable because of floods and especially droughts, lower harvests, food shortages, that destabilizes things. You have some form of civil unrest, and there is a great inclination to topple governments and try to replace them with something else that people fondly hope will, will do better. Uh, so I think it's, it's unstable conditions that, that create anger and desperation, and, and then political actors either try to increase that to make it really, really unstable, or they, or they say things like, I alone can fix it. <laughs> and uh, people, people believe them, right? Right. Because they're desperate. Uh, when Russia first invaded Ukraine, there was this debate about whether Putin would be able to make the shift from authoritarianism to totalitarianism. You know, and for people who don't know... He's doing pretty well. Yeah, well, that's... So he's doing better... <laughs> He's, do, he's doing better making that shift than he is on the battlefield. And I wonder, like, what have you learned about how people come to support or at least tolerate totalitarian regimes like what Russia is becoming or has become? They, they don't want to be shot in the back of the head. <laughs> mm. So it's fear. It's fear. So it's, it's fear and also exodus. So all the people who might be opposed to this kind of behavior get out if they can, leaving behind 
those that have no power, those that are collaborators and supporters because they're getting something out of it, and those who are just afraid. Uh, because these regimes don't fool around. Uh, when I was talking about The Handmaid's Tale early on, people were saying, well, well, why didn't they have a big street march? Well, why didn't they resist? Well, why didn't they do this and that? And we would never blah, blah. And I said, you don't understand these regimes. They will kill you. Mm -hmm. they're, they're not into uh, fairness and uh, uh, accommodation and or any of that kind of thing. They, 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 they wish to eliminate the opposition. And if you are... Um, resisting publicly, you are the opposition and you will be killed or exiled or put in jail or something like that. Yeah. What about the people who don't just sort of tolerate the regime out of fear of what might happen to them, but sort of actively participate um, in something in, 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 in it for them? Mm. Yeah. There's always jobs to be had, you know, prison guards and, um, you know, camp supervisors and jobs like that, and, and there will always be people willing to take those jobs. So Handmaid's Tale, people said, oh, why, why were women helping to uh, control other women? Answer, read some history. <laughs> it's how <laughs> colonial regimes worked. They, they recruited people from the countries that they were dominating, and there were always you know, if you can get some better pay and put food on the table, a lot of people will take that. Thank you very much. You've said that Handmaid's Tale was um, influenced in part by your experiences in several countries behind the Iron Curtain in the mid-80s. What did you see there that shaped your thinking? What did I not see there? What did I not hear there? <laughs> so it's not just what you see and hear, it's what you don't see and hear. Give you a very small example. It was in Poland, 1984. They had a, a big book festival. And there were a lot of very beautifully illustrated children's books. And I said, why are there so very many beautifully illustrated children's books? And they said, think about it. Are you thinking about it? I am. <laughs> do you have do you have the I, answer? I don't. Not political. Ah. Uh. Less likely to be controversial. That was then. Now children's books can be quite controversial in the United States, but uh, you know, stories of happy little bunny rabbits in Poland in nineteen eighty four, you were unlikely to get shot in the back of the head for that. Hmm. Or another example. Uh, let's go out into the middle of the of this field. This is Czechoslovakia. Why are we going out into the middle of the field? Because people are not going to talk to you in a room. They're not going to talk to you in a hotel. They're not going to talk to you in a car. Uh, we assumed that all of those were bugged. Uh, so out we went into the middle of the field, and then I heard some things that I could not then repeat or write about because that would get people into trouble. Okay, so it's wow. what you're not seeing and hearing, but you are maybe seeing and hearing in a field. <laughs> or other example. Yeah. 1989, so now... it's Berlin. The wall is coming down. Right at that moment, we're there. So the wall is coming down. The surly, unpleasant East German wall border guards that we had encountered in 1984 it's the same people. Now they're smiley, happy, and friendly. They're handing out cigars. They're getting their pictures taken. People are selling pieces of the wall, colored pieces with graffiti on them, more expensive. We're launching Handmaid's Tale, the movie. We launch mm. it in West Berlin first. The after party is filled with aesthetic conversations. The acting, the directing, the set design, the script, and all of the things you talk about when you talk about movies, usually, if you're not in a totalitarian regime. Then we 
we go across into East Berlin and we show it in a theater there. And this is the first time such a thing has happened since before the war, okay? Mm -hmm. Since Germany was divided. Very attentive audience, very, very attentive. Like this, mm, you know, like really concentrating. Uh, then lots of bouquets are thrown up onto the stage and people do not have aesthetic conversations. They have political conversations. Mm. First time they've been able to have a political conversation for a long time. And what they say is, this was our life. Wow. They don't mean the outfits. They mean the fact that you could not trust anybody. You never knew who you were talking to. You never knew if your next door neighbor was snitching on you. Um, you didn't know any of that. And if you saw that film a while ago called The, the Lives of Others, uh, that was very much the flavor of, of East Germany before that wall came down. You, um, you've said that you made Gilead a theocracy because of America's puritanical roots. And clearly a lot of totalitarian regimes still use religion, religious imagery, religious rhetoric. Why do you think that still works today at a time when people in most countries have become less religious over the last several years? You, you think they've become less religious. <laughs> <laughs> they may have become less traditionally religious. Uh -huh. Have you noticed the boom in astrology and tarot cards? <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. So, yeah, yeah. And, and the absolute cultism of of the interest in health, health, what you're eating, what you're putting into your body. It's like the people have got little shrines to their own bodies at which they worship daily. Um, so let, let me put it to you that I think the religious impulse is very, 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 very old and was probably an evolutionary plus and to some extent probably still is. So let us suppose that most people have an inherent tendency to believe in something bigger than themselves, whether that be a standard religion of the kinds that we know, or whether it be my daily horoscope. <laughs> yeah, the planet Venus is taking a personal interest in me. Hooray. Oh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so I... As a teenager, I went around to every religion I could get my hands on to see what they were doing in there, uh, including the spiritualist church, which at that point was a lot of quite OLD people. Uh, but they, <laughs> the word that shall not be spoken. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, and they had their own hymn book. They'd rewritten standard hymns, but with their own words. And they had their own rituals and procedures, and they had a medium on hand at every meeting of the spiritualist church. And their belief in something bigger than themselves was that there was an afterlife, and their loved ones were in it, taking a personal interest in them and sending them messages, which were never very helpful, I have to say. It was never like what horse to bet on or which stock to buy. It was things like, be careful going down the stairs on Thursday. <laughs> These are useful things. You should be careful going down the stairs on, on any day of the week. Uh, yeah, Thursdays in particular, it seems. Yeah, a little good advice. Uh, so, I, so let us pretend that there is an inherent tendency to believe in something bigger than yourself and... It's almost impossible to think of yourself as dead because you are still a noun in a sentence that mm. contains you. You say, I will be dead. There's still an I. Yeah. There's not a nothing, right? So we, it's just, it, it's kind of built into language and probably to our uh, deep past. So my feeling about religion is, if, you're, if we're going to have them, which we are, let's have good and less and less harmful ones. But there will always be some people taking advantage. And um, 
persuading other people that they've got the real insight and the truth and, and give me some money, please. Yeah, and using it as sort of a, a galvanizing force to uh, for political well, movements. Well, in, in, in the scammy area, that's, that just impacts your money. But in the political area, then people try to harness that and use it for political advantage for their own side. Mm. But uh, is this what Jesus meant? Not if you read the red parts in the Bibles that have got the words of Jesus in red. Not a word. Nothing about gay people. Thing on women, let he who is with us, without sin cast the first stone. Double dare you. Nobody threw a stone. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and you can and you can find uh, you can find the golden rule in just about every religion that exists on earth. Well, so why doesn't anybody pay attention to it? I I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess we all have the capacity for good and evil, right? Without a doubt. You forgot the third because there's three. Good, evil, and stupidity. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we're, we're swimming in that right now. <laughs> Offline is brought to you by Zbiotics. We all have busy lives these days and can't afford to waste a day stuck on the couch because of a few drinks the night before. Zbiotics is the answer we've all been looking for. Zbiotics pre alcohol probiotic is the world's first genetically engineered probiotic. It was invented by PhD scientists to tackle rough mornings after drinking. Here's how it works. When you drink, alcohol gets converted into a toxic byproduct in the gut. It's this byproduct, not dehydration, that's to blame for your rough next day. Zbiotics produces an enzyme to break this byproduct down. It's designed to work like your liver, but in your gut where you need it most. Just remember to drink Zbiotics before drinking alcohol. Drink responsibly and get a good night's sleep to feel your best tomorrow. I don't leave the house without Zbiotics anymore. Same thing with plenty of people I know now. Mm -hmm. Everyone's on the Zbiotics train. And then it's the same thing with every person. He's like, oh, you should try this. I'm like, Does it really work? I hear you on the podcast. Is that real? And the answer is yes. And I said, try it. Try, try it. it. And then the next day, everyone's like, holy shit. Holy shit. So wow. That's what's going on here. Give Zbiotics a try for yourself. Go to zbiotics.com slash offline to get 15% off your first order when you use offline at checkout. Zbiotics is backed with a 100% money back guarantee. So if you're unsatisfied for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Remember to head to zbiotics.com slash offline and use the code offline at checkout for 15% off. Thank you, Zbiotics, for sponsoring this episode. Offline is brought to you by Sundays for Dogs. Sundays is air dried dog food made from a short list of human grade ingredients. Sundays was co-founded by Dr. Tori, a practicing veterinarian. Sundays contains 90% meat, 10% vegetables, and 0% synthetic nutrients. Besides USDA beef and all-natural chicken, you'll find digestive aids like pumpkin and ginger, plus disease-fighting antioxidants. Dog parents report noticeable health improvements in their pups, including softer fur, fresher breath, better poops, and more energy. But what wow. we all want. Yeah, geez. What we all want. From your lips to God's ears from, you know, it's like, maybe I'll start eating this dog food. <laughs> Leo loves Sundays. Uh, he's ha he's had it a bunch before. He's he's a big fan. His poops are looking great. Uh, unlike other fresh dog food, Sundays is zero prep, zero mess, and zero stress. Sundays is shelf stable, which makes it easy to feed your pup top quality food. Every order ships right to your door, so you'll never have to worry about running out of dog food again. Lincoln can build a house with these things, the poops. It's true. Sundays cost 40% less than other healthy dog food brands because Sundays doesn't waste money shipping frozen packages. Instead, they spend on what matters, sourcing the best all-natural ingredients for your pup. We worked out a special deal for our dog-loving listeners. Get 35% off your first order of Sundays. Go to sundaysfordogs.com slash offline or use code offline at checkout. That's S-U-N-D-A-Y-S-F-O-R-D-O-G-S dot com forward slash offline. Upgrade your pup to Sundays and feel good about the food you feed your dog. Um, so I spent a good part of my life thinking about the political power of storytelling. First thing President Obama and I would do when we sat down to work on a speech together was figure out the story he wanted to tell because he believed that storytelling was the only real chance to persuade people. Totalitarians usually have a simple, compelling story. I can make all our problems go away if we just make those people go away who are bad and different, right? Yeah, there's always a those people. There's always a those yeah. people. <laughs> Yeah. Do you think that democracies have a simple, compelling story to tell? Well, they did during the Cold War. Uh, and the simple story was, we aren't them. <laughs> yeah. Three words. Uh, and then we got the fall of the wall, which I've described in riveting detail. And, and then we got people saying end of history, which I personally never believed. Mm. Um, 
And do you know, do you remember, remember that game called Pick Up Sticks? Mm, yeah. Where you throw this pile of sticks on the table and you were supposed to remove the sticks without making any of the others move. It was almost impossible because when you have a static, let us say, chessboard, uh, and you move one of the pieces, say the wall comes down, everything else moves. So you move one, you, you move one stick and pick up sticks, and a lot of other sticks move. So during the 90s, when people were happily going shopping and saying end of history and capitalism won and hooray for us and things like that, um, the pieces were all moving around, but people weren't paying attention. And then came uh, 9-11, and the pieces all moved around again. And then came the financial meltdown of 2008, and the pieces all moved around again. And we have a great big piece that's moving around, and that would be climate changes leading to droughts, floods, low harvests, uh, food shortages, and anger. So there are a lot of pieces in, in motion right now. What is the compelling story to tell? I think the compelling story to tell right now is there is hope. Because that's mm. what people la ask me about a lot. Is there hope? There is hope. So I would say the uh, creation of the new jobs in these sort of angry, deprived areas is a hopeful thing to do. The measures that people have already taken in respect to climate change it's, it's, it's a slightly hard story because the story is things would be a lot worse if we hadn't done those things, which, yeah. which is true, and they've got the stats on that. So, yes, we haven't done enough, but if we hadn't done anything, it would be a lot worse, et cetera, et cetera. And, I mean, if you want to do the scare thing, do you really want your Medicaid, Social Security, and new jobs to be taken away from you? Yeah. I mean, I, I, it's, it's interesting because sometimes I wonder if just the defenders of democracy have a more difficult story to tell when it's not purely in opposition to, uh, you know, the villain of the era like we were with the Soviet Union. And part of the reason I wonder if it's, if it's complicated is because what we're trying to do is stitch together this extremely diverse array of people from different backgrounds and different places. We, we do this in the United States, but also now that we're sort of a global economy, we're doing it worldwide. And it is much easier to get people to fear one another than it is for people to give one another a chance, particularly at a time of dwindling resources. Well, that's a big one. Are we really at a time of dwindling resources? <laughs> yeah, well, I was thinking about, I was thinking about climate change there and, and what, what it's doing to the yeah. world. Yeah, okay. So we did a program in the fall called Practical Utopias. Oh, yeah. I, I read about this. Yeah, okay. So having been a Victorianist, not a Victorian, I would be very old if I had been a Victorian rather than just OLD. Uh, <laughs> uh, so... The mandate was this, you shall create a material world that is uh, carbon neutral or carbon negative, scalable, that is inexpensive enough so people can do it, and attractive en enough so they will want to do it. So no, everybody has to eat nothing but tofu. So it has to be, um, it has to be uh, carbon neutral or carbon negative, scalable, and um, attractive enough. And then the second half was the social half. Who's going to make the decisions? Like what form of government shall you have? And each mm. form has got pluses and minuses. There are no free lunches in any of this, but you're aiming for the least expensive lunch. So what is the material cost of building your quite frequently, dome house made out of hempcrete. Um, what, is the <laughs> what is the cost of a hereditary monarchy? Uh, what's the downside of a, of a tyranny? Um, say a benevolent dictatorship, how fast does it take that to become not benevolent, usually pretty fast? 
Uh, what about a democracy? What are the weaknesses? What are the strengths? What kind of democracy are you talking about? So they had to work all of that out. Are you going to have a police system? If you aren't, what happens if people disagree with you and break the rules? Mm. What are you going to do? Things like that. I even threw in corpse disposal, thinking they would shy away from corpse disposal, but they were they were they were right there with the corpse disposal. They, were on it. <laughs> they, had, they had it all figured out. What system of government came out on top? Oh, they had various various circles of decision making. But remember there were eight teams and you can you can see the results. There's a, a link that where you can go to and you can look but uh, that none of them wanted a tyranny, strangely enough. Um, and they had to think about things like health care and education and what about old people and all of these things. And, and they, they really they threw themselves into it. They, we had facilitators in case they fought too much, and we had illustrators to draw pictures of what they came up with. And I, I was very, very impressed with, with them. I, th- I thought they would... Um, Thought they would give up a lot sooner. <laughs> These are complicated issues, yeah. you know. So you're going to do the hemp creep. Where are you going to get the hemp like that? Uh, and I'm here to tell you that there's a lot of new materials coming on stream, and a lot of new ways of making things. And mushrooms are going to be big in our future. Oh. So we say lack of uh, resources, but maybe we've been looking at the wrong resources. Do we really have a lack of resources? Is our fe- feeling about that based on earlier ways of doing things? Uh, and are there other newer way of doing newer ways of doing things that would solve some of these problems? Well, Mushrooms, for instance, can can dissolve plastics and clean up oil spills and be turned into fabrics. Somebody sent me a very nice mushroom hat. It's not my size, but it's very nice. <laughs> I mean, one thing that's hopeful about this is it seems when you focus people on practical decision making that could improve their lives and the lives of their community and sort of set aside um, preconceived ideologies, um, you end up with a more sort of productive outcome. Very productive outcomes. Um, but of course, this was a self-selected bunch. There were people right. who wanted to do this. There would be a lot of other people who wouldn't want to do this, and there's a huge number of people who wouldn't have the time to do this Mm. because they're running very hard just to to put food on the table and have some kind of an abode. That is right. You wrote a piece in in The Atlantic last month about a Virginia school board banning Handmaid's Tale, and at one point you wrote in this piece, here I would point out that attempts to control media content are as likely to come from the so-called left as from the so-called right, each side claiming to act in the name of the public good. Where does that show up today, Um, the the left sort of attempting to control content? Well, that's a great big discussion, isn't it? (laughs) Yeah. Um, (laughs) We've had it here a few times. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So I think you'd have to go into the washroom with some people who work at media companies, swear that your phone is turned off, and ask them to tell you the real truth. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. yeah, so a certain amount of self-selection goes on there. Uh, and that is why there are all these spin-offs like podcasts and um, substacks and other things that are not subject to editorial policy of that particular kind. Uh, but, you know, everybody, and this is just a human thing, so pretend you're a Viking. Mm-hmm. You're going to go on a Viking raid, and you need some some Vikings to go with you. You're going to ch- choose Vikings that are pals of yours and that you can trust. Are you not? Oh yeah, for sure. So people, peop, yeah, for sure. Uh, people select in that way. They they select groups of people to work with who are copacetic with them. And uh, that's why Practical Utopias was such an interesting experiment, because none of these people knew one another. They're going to have to get along and trust one another, even though they did not know one another. But but mostly, uh, we 
congregate into into groups of people who agree with us. <laughs> yes. And that happens yes. on, on both sides of the equation. Uh, we have been through, I would say, an, a, a period of extreme moral panics. I think we're coming out of the end of the tunnel, and that, that would be on the on the left, I think the extreme moral panic is now setting in on the right. <laughs> because I've noticed that. When you have Tucker Carlson saying that he really hates Donald Trump and that news becomes public, you're going to get some panic going on there. <laughs> what? <laughs> well, one thing I this hear... This person that I trusted. Yeah, right. Yeah. One thing I hear a lot from friends on the left is, you know, the, the real extremism right now is on the right... The Republican Party has become more extreme. Donald Trump, you know, sent out a tweet, series of tweets that helped incite Without a violent Without a doubt. Sure, this is all true. Right? Yeah. And then... So then the next sentence is, therefore, you should give us a, a free pass on all the shit that we've been doing. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's not even that. It's like, well, we have to have a strategy and tactics that stop that extremism. And then, you know, it's... You know, if someone getting called, someone getting canceled isn't as dangerous as some of the hate speech that's on the rise towards marginal, marginalized people. And uh, maybe we do want to take down the Trump tweets, uh, even if we don't like them, because they are inciting violence. And one thing I always struggle with is, and I have in the Trump era, is like, how do you calibrate an effective response to extremism that doesn't compromise the democratic principles that you're fighting for? Okay, instead of using the word progressive, why don't they use the word fair? Mm, yeah. <laughs> mm. Why is that? Yeah. The word progressive and progress, there's some baggage there. So uh, eugenics was once considered a progressive movement in the name of which a number of women got sterilized against their wills. Stuff like that. And I remember from my childhood, you can't stop progress. And what that usually meant was, we're going to do something you don't like. <laughs> but it's progress. Hey, you can't stop it. Right. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm slightly allergic. I'm, I'm fairly allergic to, to those words, and I would like to see people just talking about what is fair. And since your real audience, uh, since, since anybody's real audience in the United States, the people you really have to convince are, are the independents, mm. you know, because it's parti pris, it's, it's sides chosen on the other extremes. You're not going to get them to uh, change their minds. Their minds are made up. But it's people in the middle who are looking at this, they're looking at that. Well, who's representing that that reasonable middle where I'm not going to get shot in the back of the head. That's what that's what yeah. they're looking for. And what is going to actually work? What is going to be fair? Uh, what is going to make it so that I can walk down the street without people yelling at me? Uh, this kind of thing. Well, and in a way, it's even more important to convince those people in times of extremism and rising authoritarianism. And Those like you people said, are always under attack at times of extremism and rising authoritarianism because, um, because they are the people that each side wishes to convert. Right. So when, once you hear people saying, you're either for me or you're against me, you know you're talking to an extremist. Yeah. Um, well, you, you've written that in times of extremism and polarization like these, uh, fiction writers are particularly suspect because they write about human beings and people are morally ambiguous. The aim of ideology is to eliminate ambiguity. I interviewed um, gotcha. I interviewed uh, Chimamanda Adichie for this podcast and she told me that she's, she's worried that literature is becoming flat and boring because people are afraid to write about morally complex subjects and characters. Uh, do, you, do you ever feel that? What do you think about that? Oh, I think about that all the time. Um, but I'm too old to give a hoot. <laughs> so I will continue to write about <laughs> morally ambiguous characters because, because that's the truth. That's the truth about people. Everyone has a shadow side. Sometimes the shadow side is very unpleasant. 
Uh, sometimes it's just a well of doubt and confusion, but everyone has one. And um, to leave that out, so I sometimes say to people, okay, so I'm going to write a novel in which everybody is well-behaved all the time and very, very nice. <laughs> Would you read it? No, it doesn't, doesn't sound like, doesn't <laughs> there, sound like an Atwood novel, that's like for sure. There is a book like that. <laughs> it is not. It's a novel by, uh, by Richardson, and it's called Sir Charles Grandison, and it's 600 pages long. So a novel of the 18th century. So he wrote a book called, called Pamela, in which an uh, upper-class guy tries to seduce the servant maid uh, and fails, ends up marrying her. Then he wrote one called Clarissa, in which the woman does get seduced and, and gives birth to twins and dies, also seduced by an aristocratic person. Then a deputation of aristocrats comes to him and says, we're not all bad. <laughs> we're not all like that. We want you to write a... <laughs> you think I'm making this up, don't you? I'm not. <laughs> uh, we want you to write a... A novel in which a, a, an aristocrat behaves well, like like most of us, because we behave well. And he says, "Okay," <laughs> and he does. He writes Sir Charles Grandison, which starts off very uh, promisingly with the heroine almost getting kidnapped by highwaymen. But Sir Charles Grandison steps in and rescues her, <laughs> as as he would, and. Off they go to his country house in which he has some very nice sisters who act as chaperones. And the rest of the 600 pages is all about good things that Sir Charles Grandison does. And I keep, I'm the only person who's actually finished this book because oh, wow. I'm very cynical. And I keep waiting for the point where we go down to the cellar and find out that he's running a coin forgery or that he's got, you know, some female vampires chained to pillars in the cellar. Not, nothing. We just keep going. He just keeps being good. And that's why I'm the only person who's ever finished this. So, yeah, it's, it's not, it's number one, not interesting, but number one, number two, not true. Yeah. He must have done something bad. Did, it, did he ever even get just a little bit drunk? Apparently not. <laughs> Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, it's funny. It's something I've been thinking about a lot when I have a, a, a two and a half year old and I... Oh, boy. He, he, I know. He, yeah. And he, he demands that I tell him stories every night before bed. And so at first, I, you want to shield a child from anything that's bad out there, right? That's like the first instinct of a parent when the child is young. And so I'm telling only happy stories and he's sort of bored by the happy stories and you do have to start, I'm realizing that I, the stories that I tell where there's some conflict or there's some drama or there's someone's acting badly, you know, like those are the stories that he wants to hear because that's what the human condition is. And I guess we're sort of programmed to find that more interesting than the, uh, the 600 pager well, that you just because... spoke about. Okay, so it, it, it alerts us to uh, the truth that there are dangers out there, and those kinds of stories prepare us for the fact that there are dangers out there and maybe give us some coping mechanisms. Mm. Uh, but also, children are always told to behave themselves and be good, so stories about people not behaving themselves and not being good are quite compelling to them. <laughs> Here's a story from... From my life, so I had a little, um, this four and a half, five year old who was up in my room where where I had a bookshelf and it was mostly poetry and essays and stuff. And he said, "I want you to read something from one of your books." And the only thing I could think of was <laughs> Stephen King's book on writing, which is, yes. by the way, pretty good. I know. Okay, I like that book. so I, th I seem to remember that there was something about S Stephen King as a child, and I thought, well, this will be interesting. So I start reading and <laughs> find myself in the middle of the anecdote in which he has this babysitter from hell who has locked him in the coat cupboard where he's thrown up on his mother's shoes. <laughs> and my, my little child is going, his eyes are getting bigger and bigger. And, bigger. <laughs> and, and then he says, he says, read that again. <laughs> <laughs> read that again he never heard of such a thing yeah uh, 
that's so what, that's what people want. I was an aficionado of Grimm's fairy tales, unexpurgated versions, and they're pretty tough. You know, it's the ones with the uh, wrenched out eyeballs and red hot nails and uh, uh, pretty gruesome things, you know, heads falling down the chimney and what have you. But some children don't like those. My sister didn't like them. The only one that she liked was the Twelve Dancing Princesses, which which ends well. <laughs> it has a lot of par- party frocks in it. Yeah. Uh, but I, w- I was up for the heads falling down the chimney. Offline is brought to you by Bite. Did you know you swallow 5 to 7% of our- your toothpaste every single time you brush your teeth? Yeah, That's an entire blob of toothpaste every seven days. Most commercial toothpaste are filled with harsh chemicals, artificial flavors, and preservatives, not stuff you'd want to be putting in your mouth, let alone eating. That's why Bite makes dry toothpaste tablets made with clean ingredients that are sulfate-free, palm oil-free, and glycerine-free. Bite toothpaste bits are so convenient. You just pop a bit in your mouth, chew it up, and start brushing. It will turn to paste just like you're used to, but with no plastic tube or messy paste. You're going to think you're an astronaut. Yeah, surprise. (laughs) (laughs) That's how great it is. Just pop this bit in your mouth, boom, you got toothpaste. They also come in refillable glass jars, and they send refills in compostable pouches. They're better for our bodies and our earth. No more plastic toothpaste tubes. You know, the toothpaste tubes are pretty gross. It's the whole thing's No matter gross. how many times you wipe off the extra toothpaste, there's always more. It's a buildup of toothpaste everywhere. It goes all over the place. You get on your clothes, forget it. You got a new shirt on. Forget it. There's a toothpaste forget on it. it. Now you got to change. Bite sleek glass bottles and jars look amazing on your vanity and elevate your shelfy game. No hiding gooey plastic tubes here. Bite is offering our listeners 20% off your first order. Go to trybite.com slash offline or use code offline at checkout to claim this deal. That's T-R-Y-B-I-T-E dot com slash offline. So how do you think the internet has changed uh, the craft of writing and the challenge of storytelling? This is something I've been thinking about a lot. Um, novel writing, story writing, not so much. Book promotion a lot. Yeah, so it's in the area of dissemination. Yeah, it's the area of dissemination where it has changed a lot. And do you put ads in newspapers or do you do you do social media? And uh, I remember when one of my publishers had a social media expert who who had an office that was basically a, a closet. But their domain has expanded. You may have noticed that. Yeah. Yeah. So the other thing they do is they they put people up to doing this. And uh, some of them just don't like it very much. And others get bombarded and all the usual things that happen. But I I got onto Twitter by accident back in um, 2009 at a point where my publishers thought I was a nut nut to be doing it. We all are. It's okay. <laughs> we're um, all we're all a nut. <laughs> we're all nuts on everyone on Twitter. We're all a little nuts. I mean, one of the stories in your in your new book, uh, "Old Babes in the Wood," is an interview between you and a, and a deceased George Orwell, uh, where you touch on the internet, telling him that even though it started with good intentions, its effect has been to collapse privacy and erode the notion of the individual. Why do you think the internet has eroded the notion of the individual? Well, everybody thinks that that there's no privacy and that everything's public, but that's not actually true. It's only true if you go on the internet. (laughs) (laughs) If you don't go on it, (laughs) if you don't go on it, things are different. Okay. Uh, But this erosion of privacy in the individual was happening long before. Remember I told you about going out into a field uh, in 1984. So it used to be called getting your house bugged or... Um, not knowing who is a spy. Uh, so yes, we've been we've been snooping on one another, uh, like forever, and it's even in the Bible, mm. snooping. So before invading something, they send spies, right? Of course, like any normal person would. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So all of that, you aren't who you you aren't who you say you are. Impostures, scams, uh, lying, snooping, uh, all of this is, has been going on for a very long time indeed. You can yeah. go back to the reign of Elizabeth I and look at her spy network. 
which was quite extensive. Mm. Yeah. Like that. And now it's now it's all of us all the time. Uh, spying on each other. Well, I wouldn't say that. You know, <laughs> I, I don't think that's true. It's 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 all of you all the time. If that's where you want to be. Yeah, that's true. So if you can keep off your phone for one second, then you can have some moments of privacy. I'm trying. I'm trying. Uh, many a lot of the stories. I'm in, um, <laughs> yeah, that's it's been a it's an ongoing effort now. Um, a lot of the stories in Old Babes in the Wood are about sort of looking back and the wisdom that comes with age. What do you what do you want young people to know that you wish you knew? Oh, you can't tell them anything. You know that. <laughs> I do, um, I do, so skipping over. <laughs> <laughs> because they need to they need to find out for themselves and their times are different from yours. Mm. So among the the Inuit they have a custom which is Old people don't give advice unless they are asked. Mm. Okay? So I have a piece in my book of essays called Burning Questions called Polonia. And the ask was exactly what you just asked me. What advice would you give young people? The answer is none, unless they ask. So I am a sort of unstoppable advice giver. I'm did put it in the piece, but I was in a supermarket and there were two guys and they were discussing the fact that their dishwasher wasn't working. And I said, without being asked, have you changed the filter? And they said, there's a filter. (laughs) 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 Yeah, so sometimes your advice is helpful. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. But if it's young people, they will not hear it Unless they have asked. Yeah, I am definitely not a young person anymore. I'm 41, but I am at the age oh, where I am. Oh, you look extremely young to me. Oh. <laughs> 40, 40, <laughs> 41 is a I mere am, nothing. Um, I'm, I'm at the age where I'm young enough, um, young enough to, 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 know, to want advice um, for, the, for the next half of my life, hopefully, but, um, but uh, old enough to know that... Uh, I don't, I don't know everything anymore. So do you have any good advice? You don't. <laughs> yeah, we used to have a sign on our refrigerator that went something like, go, tired of putting up with your stupid parents? Move out, get a job while you still know everything. <laughs> but that's for like teenagers. That. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yes, I remember being a teenager. I knew everything. Uh, but it, it, it wears off. It wears mm. off. It certainly but does. But 41 with a young young child. So you, you need probably to be on a, a parent blog. They will give you <laughs> lots of advice. They do. Too much advice. Too yeah. much advice. Hard to but, curate but that. But you need to know, yeah, before taking in any advice, you need to know what you need to know. You need to know what kind of advice to ask for. And it's usually pretty specific, is it not? What do I do it, it if is. my kid does... Yeah. Fill in the blank. <laughs> what if my kids keep sticking beans up his nose? Uh, <laughs> I don't know the answer to that one, but it happens. Yeah, it uh, certainly does. It's, uh, you, you get surprised every day with a, new, with a kid. Yes, you can't tell them not to do something if you haven't anticipated this thing that they're about to do. Like, I never thought yeah, they would gotta... do that. <laughs> That which which happens literally every day to us. Um, you said on the Today Show this week that you're writing a memoir. Uh, what made you decide to do that? Oh, I got in a lot of trouble for saying that. Uh, my publishers <laughs> were, you, went, were you not supposed to? Went, don't say that! Don't say that! Don't say that! Yes, we want it to be a surprise. Well, it's not a surprise, uh, but I'm not supposed to say anything about it. Okay. So here's me not saying anything about it. <laughs> well, I well, I had to try. I had to try. It'll be I'll be yeah. eager to read it. So will I. Yeah. First, I'll have to write it, won't I? <laughs> That's right. That's a, just a small thing in there. Uh, Margaret Atwood, thank you so much for joining offline. Uh, this was wonderful, and I appreciate your time and your wisdom. A pleasure for me, and good luck. Thank you so much. Especially wait till well wait till they get to the age of four. Oh boy. Then then you're in trouble. I know it. I'm prepared. 